The Garden of Ink and Bones is a monthly podcast about witchcraft, powerful plants, and making magic. I'm Belle of Belladonna and Bones, and I'll be joined by occult artist Rue of Old Omen, and we're witches who like to get our hands dirty. To us, magic is practical, visceral, and bound in blood to the soil and bones of our spiritual allies. It's time to get your hands into the dirt, do the work, make magic, and feel the witchcraft in your bones. Welcome to the Garden of Ink and Bones. Hello and welcome to the Garden of Ink and Bones. I'm Belle of Belladonna and Bones and with me this week is Rue of Old Omen. Hi Rue. Hey everyone, I hope you're all staying warm in this insanely cold weather. Oh yeah, it is uh, It is heading up close to the here and I have the, uh, the oil heater on here in the recording studio aka my bedroom. Um, but uh, yeah, it is just bitter. How is it up there in uh, sunny... New South Wales coast. <laughs> oh my god, the whole day was just thick fog. It seriously looked like something out of Silent Hill. <laughs> like, at the moment I have woolen socks, sheepskin boots, a dressing gown, fleece pants, and it's still just absolutely frigid. It is insane. See? The glamorous life of the witch people. This is how glamorous we <laughs> <they> are. <laughs> yeah, dank and dark. <laughs> Um, yeah, so this week, this month, we've got um, some fantastic things to talk about with you. We've gone off the witchy track in terms of books, and we're going to talk about um, Plant Medicine by Richo Chech. And we are also going to recap on uh, The Way Safe the Gate, Gate is Open by Katie Gerard. Um, we'll recap on working with Amita, and also we will popular request to talk about Wormwood. So we've got a lot of exciting things to talk about, but uh, before that, what have you been up to, Ru? Ah, oh, the joyous, joyous times of being an adult, i.e. far too much work. But um, I've actually been really, really, really excited after our last discussion on the Fly Algaric of collecting caps and such. I've got a, a pretty exciting plan for the winter solstice next week, so I'll discuss that a bit later. But how about yourself? Hmm, I have noisy computers but um one of the things i've been up to is i've been doing a lot of um pottery work and um so i've been making these molds so that i can pour the same form over and over again and um i've made some basically what i'm going to do is etch some witchy herbs into them so that we'll have like mini um i guess porcelain um vessels with um, witchy herbs into them and stuff like that so I they'll be so basically I'll cast the form and then the etching will happen individually so um, that's a bit of a long-term project it's not um, not the fastest thing pottery is a multi-step process um, especially when you're making molds so um, there's lots of firings and glazings and and different things that have to happen so so that's a pretty exciting one but uh, definitely a a learning experience <laughs> making molds it does not work well with my Aries temperament of instant gratification <laughs> yeah no that sounds so fascinating I'm curious to see what they come out like yeah so one of the things um that I did come across in the last month I was in Launceston of all places and they have a really nice bookshop down there called Petrarch's P-E-T-R-A-R-C-H-S. Um, and they had a lot of sort of local books, as you'd expect for, you know, a touristy town like Launceston. Um, but one of the ones I came across was um, by E.V. Lassac and T. McCarthy, and it's called Australian Medicinal Plants, um, A Complete Guide to Identification and Usage. And... I thought I picked it up thinking this is going to be another one of those ones where it's just all the European plants and you know I'm going to have this 17 times over in my bookshelf. But no, it's melaleucas and um, different Australian plants. You know, there's prunellas and stuff in it as well, um, you know, like self heal and stuff like that. But there's, it's mainly different Australian natives, um, which 
is just incredible because you just don't get that information all in one's place. So I was um, ridiculously excited to to pull that one down. So, um, you know, it's a $40 book, um, not cheap, but it's broken up by different the different systems of the body. Um, it's probably a little light on information, but... Um, for the book that it is, you know, it's got so many plants in it and different things about the preparations, um, different preparations of the Indigenous um, peoples. Uh, wow. I was really super impressed and I just wanted to mention that one because it's not one you sort of come across in the normal herb circles. Um, there are some colour photos in it which are really useful. Others you'll have to look up online. Um you know, there's just different things you don't, you know. <sighs> Australian plants can get a little, they're just all the same. <laughs> you know, you look at them and go, I I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that is, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, we've all heard of, like, um, paturi and things like that, you know, dubiosa, hopwoody, um, or would I. Um but we haven't heard about, like, there's an entire chapter on narcotics and um, painkillers and then another chapter on um, headaches, colds and fevers and things like that. So really super interesting, um, full of information, um, definitely written with a scientific bent but still has a reasonable anthropological um, bent because it does try to talk about how the Indigenous people used it Um so, yeah, just wanted to get that one out there because there's lots of great books going around, but that's a, a bit of a rarity in terms of Australian um, medicinal plants. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. I'm definitely going to hunt down a copy after this. Yeah, just did not, just couldn't expect it. It was like, wow, that is that is something different. So, um, so to start with, let's recap on uh, Katie Gerard and Saith. I've found one really, really, really beneficial thing that I've gotten out of that book this month was really? I was really struggling with my meditation. Mm -hmm. Like I was just, I'd just gotten to that point where I was doing the same meditation every day and I was, I was doing it for the sake of doing it. Um, and yeah, it was nice. And occasionally, you know, one day out of three or four, I was, you know, getting to a really good point with it. But what I did was really step back and take the time to prepare my space a bit more because um, I'd been just doing it walking. Um, so I tried to – and I'd been doing it at lunchtime at work. Um, so I, I still wanted to do that. But what I did was instead of continuing to walk while I did it, I found myself a space um, at a park and I – took a stick and basically drew a circle and um, I actually made a space um, for myself to do oh. it in, which was different because I've always been a bit of the, the witch that just likes to you know, just go at it, especially for meditation. I just want to do the meditation, get it done with, don't have patience. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so thinking about her her thoughts on on making place to do your meditation and, um, you know, your psychic first aid and psychic um, defence and preparation for those sort of moments, um, I really put a little bit more effort in and it made a huge difference to my experience. Wow, that's awesome to hear because I know you've sort of spoken about struggling with some of these things in the past, so that's really interesting to hear. You know, and it's funny because, like, it's almost practice what you preach because I always tell people to do that. Take the time to prepare, you know, have a shower, um, and clean the space so it's not cluttered um, and, you know, all of that. But then when it comes to my thing, I'm like, yeah, I'll just sit down here. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like that quote from Alice in Wonderland of, I give very good advice but I very seldom follow it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I know how you feel. What about you? Did you do any work with that this month? Um, I did. So I got this awesome little app 
Um, it's on my other phone, which I don't have in reach at the moment. I can't remember the name of it, but I found it. I'm sure you'd be able to find it on either the iPhone store or the HTC store. And it's a um, drumming app right. that's on those, I think it's like four beats per second or something that's meant to be able to get you into that trance state. So I did a bit of work with that while sort of before going to bed, while I'm sort of in that relaxed state and I have a moment to sort of try and focus on it. And yeah, it reminded me again of how much I love trance work and another reminder of why don't I do it more often lately. Mm-hmm. Especially at this time of year. Yeah, when it's dark and quiet and it's, you know, that time of introversion. So, yeah, it's it's such a winter thing, hey? Yeah, and it is. It's just, you know, it's much easier to be inside and make yourself a cosy space to meditate in than it is in summer where your brain just wants to go outside. So, yeah, go outside and play in the garden. Yeah, exactly. Not that that's not its own form of meditation, but. Um, yeah um I think that was mainly it for that book for me this month and you know when I it seems like some something really insignificant but it's really been quite major um to be able to sort of rediscover that um that meditation practice with more I guess intent yeah and it's one of those things that in the past I used, you know, I go through phases where I do heaps and heaps and heaps of it and I feel like I get these astounding and powerful results and then all of a sudden something switches and I just stop doing it for like months and months and months on end and then I go, oh, there's that thing I used to do and then go back and do it and go, yeah, this is why I do this thing. But I don't know, it's one of those things that it's just so potent when you actually do sort of get a grasp on it. Mm. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Um, on to Artemisia. Um, no, no, not on to Ad- Artemisia. On to Amanita. <laughs> um, <laughs> Fly Agaric was our Herb of the Month last month, and um, it's just been that time of year with those gorgeous little red toadstools are popping up everywhere. Um, so it, it's been pretty amazing to spend some more time with that spirit um, throughout that time. And I know you've been doing some work as well, Rue, so why don't you tell us about it? Yeah, so we do have the the winter solstice coming up next week. And fly agaric is one of those things that, you know, not only is it something that you find during those winter months, but it is such a sort of almost introverted tool like, like the trance work and it is something to sort of be able to delve into other worlds. So I've got planned, which I'll take photos when they are up since the solstice is next week, of um, drawing the caps and having them upside down and stuffing them with herbs and having candles lit to try and do some spirit connection work with the underworld. So I'm, I'm really, really excited to see how this little plan will come out, almost like the candles, the stalk of a toadstool upside down, and then, yeah, the various herbs that will burn through it. Gorgeous. So, yeah, what a... Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. What have you been up to with your fire garrics? Well... I know you've got something planned. Yeah, well, again, um, I'd had I harvested just before last episode when they were drying. Um, if not, mm. I, yeah, they, they've been drying, and because they've been drying throughout the, the period of the last month, um, the smell's been everywhere. My whole house has been full of it, and, you know, to the point of little mushrooms in my dreams and things like that and, um, <laughs> and a really strong sense of the spirit and its sense of timing um it's I don't feel like it has a it has a delayed gratification act, aspect to it um you know not so much on a psychoactive level but certainly on a magical level sometimes um you know and I went to work with it at the full moon but came across a um, astrological um, note that said that things done under that full moon would have lasting repercussions, and it it just stuck in my head. Um, and I just thought, you know what, this is something here is just not right. I'm not going to do any work under this full moon. Um, didn't want to didn't want to push the spirit to do the work either. Um, so what happened was I held off and I've started to get things ready 
to work up to the new moon, which seems to be much more comfortable for the spirit and um, and probably leaning into that um, the darkness of the moon and the, it being the new moon before um, the winter solstice as well. So um, really taking the um, fly agaric and finding what it wants to do and a lot of it is around smokes and incenses and I think it, it ties in with what you were talking about in terms of flame and um, and herbs and things like that and then also um, looking for some new partners for it in balms um, you know I have my set um, of amanitas um, that the balms that work with it and I wanted to I wanted to pull them into a different mindset um so I've been working with some um, calamus root that I've been growing and um a few other things that I've been putting I've been putting into a balm that's been sort of steeping um constantly and it's actually really interesting because it's not just the it's not just putting them into the balm, it's the almost mandala sort of aspect of the creation and the way they're being placed into the oil in the copper vessel with the amanita um, and, and, you know, steeping in those different things and stuff like that. So it's kind of a different aspect. And then also looking at individual um, caps and helping them prepare to be spirit vessels. Well, sorry, that sounds wrong because they are already spirit vessels. Um, but trying to work with them to help them understand that they're going to go out into the world um, as part of a, a thing that you and I are putting together um, to help spread the message more, you know. Um, so, so basically, mm. guys, what, what we've been looking at is if you know me and my work, I used to do these boxes, magical subscription boxes um, called Magica Herbe. Um, basically, this will be a special edition of this. Um, we have done an Amanita version in the past, but this is not just Amanita. It will incorporate some of the other herbs that we've spoken about through the, um, through the podcast and a few other special things. Um, some of my pottery, but not the, the porcelain etch stuff, but I do have some little bowls, offerings bowls that are glazed. You might have seen them on my Instagram recently. Um, they'll go into it so that you can, you know, use those as offering bowls or to light charcoal in or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. and, I'm and so some, incredibly excited about this. Yeah, and just, you know, special things, like really to help you so to honour the spirits that we've been working with um, throughout the time, and 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 you know at a at a very base level, it will help pay for the podcast. It does cost us money to put together. We now have an editor um, who does our audio engineering for us each month. Um, all of these people need to be paid, um, including our hosting and different things like that. So um, putting this box together is a bit a way to thank all those spirits and also pay our bills, um, which, you know, is not a huge issue, but we would like the podcast to be self-sustaining in its own way. So um, it's part of that. And, you know, we said it wouldn't turn into a, a selling thing, but we just want you to know that sometimes you're going to have to do things like this just to pay for um, all the things that we do along with the podcast. So, um, so yeah, we've got this really awesome thing. Rue's doing some awesome things for it. I'm doing some things for it. And then, um, in at the winter solstice, we will show you those awesome things, and uh, and hopefully with a very very limited edition. Um, you know, I think we're going to look at sort of 10, 10 to thirteen boxes. I like thirteen; it's always a good number. <laughs> mm -hmm. It um, is a good number. <laughs> that's the true. Is coming up. Yeah, next month. Oh, yeah. Next month. Um, <laughs> So yeah, that's uh, that's what we've got coming up there, and and it was really all inspired by, um, by Amanita and and the work that I've done with it in the past, and getting it out there, and you know how Rue and I feel about this plant, um, fungi, 
and um, yeah, so that's pretty exciting. Yeah, incredibly. So, I'm also saying exciting, we're talking about today, Wormwood. We are. Which is definitely, yeah, this is one of my favourite herbs that I've, I think I've had it before I even sort of thought about being a witch. It's just one of those things that I've always sort of had as a kid in the garden, but yeah, yeah. Let's talk about wormwood. Artabisia absinthium. So the true wormwood, um, the the plant that gives absinthe its name, um, the green fairy, you know, um, it is so many things, this plant. And, um, yeah, you, you can't even begin to list them, um, all the different things that this plant is. Mm, it seems like it just pops up in a lot of different cultures. Like I know I was even reading about an ancient Aztec cult, uh, festival honouring the goddess of salt where the women would wear like headdresses made out of it and the chosen one at the end of it would be sacrificed and, you know, then you see it in Asia and it's just it's absolutely everywhere. And I think it's one of those ones as well that everybody tends to sort of have in their garden it's just so pretty to look at and I love the smell of it and uh, it's just such a fascinating one yeah exactly it, it's it's happy it's um it smells incredible just like the Clarius age you know you only have to just brush past it past it and it is amazing um you mm. know you can use it for so many things um it doesn't give up its mysteries easily no like, like it doesn't break it doesn't break down either chemically or mystically very well like it it, it waits for you to get a whole understanding yeah definitely and i mean you sort of look at it as well of in absinthe of course of that's where most of us would sort of be familiar with it from but that sort of crazy delirium that it puts you into that you've sort of got no control over and it's just yeah the green fairy it's one of those things that it's definitely a really really interesting mysterious herb like you said it's not something that just comes easily and i don't think you ever really get control over it yeah you're exactly right it's interesting i was um i was reading over harold roth's um treatise on wood as from his book, The Witching Herbs, and he talks about it being a Mars herb, um, but having some aspects of the moon as well. And I, th I think I see the Mars aspects in that it is very all or nothing, um, you know, mm. and it's very, it can be very harsh in terms, it's very bitter, um, you know, those sort of things are very Mars about it. But yes, of course, it has the silvery leaves. Um, it has a softness in the smell that's very um, moon-like and things like that. So I can see what Harold's saying in terms of it being moon-like, but um, I, I also probably another Aries thing is just really feeling that Mars aspect of it. So mm, Definitely. Actually, one of the things he, um, he has in there, which I do love doing with Wormwood, is um, adding it to ink. Um, he says it was wow. used to prevent insects from gnawing on manuscripts. Um, and in the Greek magical wow. papyri recipe for ink, um, the ink is applied to the operator's hand. Um, so, yeah, that, to actually give you a, a bit of a magical boost. So um, Yeah, well, I mean, it's one of those ones that I think if we look at it in a non-magical sense, the main thing it, it's for is for getting rid of parasites. It's, you know, people talk about yeah, it's putting a it into your dog's beds to repel fleas or consuming it to get rid of intestinal parasites. It's one of those things that definitely pushes things away. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's a, one of the things, one of the all or nothing things I was thinking about is how, um, Pharmaceutical companies have been studying wormwood for years, try, use, trying to use it for malaria because, you know, they're, in Asian countries it's used for to treat malaria. And um, they've been trying to, you know, take all the different chemicals out of it and, and turn it into something they could patent. 
Um, and there's a malaria clinic run by, I think it's run by some Australian ladies in um, Malaysia, and they got a permit to run a straight, they were just crushing up dried wormwood, putting it into capsules and administering it to um, patients with drug-resistant malaria. And the straight crushed wormwood in quite high doses, it must be said, um, was able to effectively cure these people of drug-resistant malaria, whereas all of the concentrated chemical parts of the plant weren't. Um, And I think that's partially that that spirit of driving out uh, disease. Yeah, wow, that's that's fascinating. Yeah, I'll find the... um, I'll find the links to the articles about it and pop it into the thing. So one of the things, um, wormwood is, of course, absinthe. And, um, you know, there's as many recipes for absinthe as there is um, types of artemisias, really. Um, You know, some people say that um, absinthe is actually, the original absinthe were actually pontifica, so Roman wormwood. Um, which kind of would make sense in some ways because it's quite a sweet one would um, and more pleasant on the tongue than um, true one would. Um, but at the same time, absinthium has a much higher food germ rate um, than pontifica. So, you know, there, there's always that if you're talking about people making absinthe and getting really, really smashed off their brains. <laughs> Yeah, I had a person once tell me that I'd been bringing it, said that he insisted that the traditional recipes also called for cannabis oh, yeah. to get that real hallucinogenic delirium that, you know, you sort of hear about in Victorian France. Mm-hmm. But um, like you said, there's, I swear, there's a thousand different recipes for making absinthe. And I remember as a teenager, some friends actually found some wormwood growing in a graveyard of all places and so they decided you know oh they'd try their hand at making absinthe moonshine none of them remember anything that happened they all just got insanely sick for the next few days after that it was really quite hilarious to watch but yeah you know the idea is fun as a teenager (laughs) actually if you're looking for some recipes for um wormwood uh for absinthe then i recommend um the Encyclopedia of Psychoactive Plants by Christian Rash. Um, it is a giant tome on all of the psychoactive plants. Um, it'll cost you a reasonable amount of money to, um, to own, but it has a classical recipe in there from um, that's attributed to the Perno recipe. Um, and then also a recipe by the late great Dale Pendle, who um, wrote wrote Pharmacoanosis um, and that series of books. Um, But his is, uh, he developed a recipe that was specifically to induce profound psychoactive effects. And I do really want to make it. It contains wormwood, hyssop, calamus root, lemon balm, anise, fennel seed, uh, star anise fruits, um, and coriander seeds, and then it's put in high proof alcohol, so 85 to 95 percent alcohol, um, and it's steeped uh, for a week, which would work out nicely between the new moon and um, midwinter. And um, then you add in some water to break down the alcohol, which you know, of course, you need to. Um, yeah, so it's a, it sounds like a pretty full on recipe. Um, so I'm definitely going to give that a go because Dale hasn't steered me wrong um, with recipes in the past. Sometimes they've got some significant kick to them, though. So what are some other ways? So other than you know absinthe, of course, what are some other ways that you have used wormwood in the past? Um, one of the things that actually is in Dale's books um, is to use it to create your own type of holy water. Um, and I've definitely used it for that. Um, it's fantastic for um, making um, 
sprinkles and sprays and things like that you know distilled it through the um through the copper still and wormwood gives off a blue essential oil which is just i found so hard to actually get out of the plant um and i've i've gotten some of it in the past but the azulene the blue has not really come up as strongly as i would have liked but the strength of the essential oil is just bonkers it's one of those ones you just cannot use by itself um but the hydrosol is just gorgeous to use as to to cleanse and purify an area um, because it also puts that um, that turns that space into a space where you can preempt your psychoactive things or other things you might do in that space you know whether you're layering on ointments or other things like that um, the wormwood sets the scene quite well awesome yeah I'd really love to get um you have to post a copy of the holy water recipe as well because that's something that I've naturally used wormwood for in the past is using it for exactly that of purifying yourself especially when you sort of feel like you've got somebody that's you know you meet those people with a really toxic energy that just clings to you i've always found when it's just amazing for just stripping everything off you yeah yeah that's a really good point it is fantastic at banishing um energies in your aura for want of a better word um it, it is funny i do i do wonder whether harold um had a lot of the warnings he has in his book put in there by um, editors of Wiser after the fact because he does say um, never consume uh, wormwood in any form. And it's like, really? <laughs> um, it's strong, but nah, perhaps not. Um, that might just be more along the lines of, you know, covering their ass in terms of, um, you know, what they can and can't put in their books true what else do i love to use it's a great it's a great balm it's a great flying movement um it's great for um like wand consecration so if you've got a wooden wand and you make up a um simple beeswax and oil so you just steep your wormwood in the oil um you know, either in an oven on keep warm, so, you know, not even hot overnight, or, you know, you can you can heat it over a very, very low flame if you're careful and you're watching it 100% of the time. But you'll want to do that with a dried wormwood um, in oil. And then once it's steeped in, add about a quarter of the weight of oil you have beeswax, and you'll end up with a, a soft ointment. Um, that you can then use to rub on um, on wands and things like that or um, use on wooden chopping boards and things that you might use for spell work and stuff, keeping in mind that you wouldn't then use that for other stuff, um, you know, so places where you put pentacles and things like that. Those those are always good. I like wood for that sort of work as well. Hmm. And it ties also, it sort of reminded me that it ties into what we were talking about last month of Sorry about the noise in the background. Um, it ties into doing trans work though, of, you know, talking about protecting yourself before entering other places. And those balms that you mentioned, are, and I have used your one of your balms actually in the past that had wormwood in it for exactly that of anointing yourself before you do any travel work for that extra bit of protection. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I like it for anointing masks and things as well. Um, I found it, you know, because we say one of the things that was used for um, giving fairy sight. Um, so my flower fay balm um, is is predominantly a wormwood base with rose um, and honeysuckle and, and things in it. And it's really good to, you know, um, anoint uh, above the eyes or onto a mask that you might uh, wear to see the fairies um, and the fae. I found that very useful as well. Hmm. Um, what do you think of the Wormwood Spirit? Definitely got a soft spot for it. It's one of those ones that I've always been so, so fascinated with. But um, I feel like I can never really get a finger on exactly what it is. 
if that makes sense. It always just feels like every time I sort of try to figure yeah. it out, it's always changing and always sort of almost mischievous. But I can never, I don't know, I, I love it, I'm fascinated by it, but I can never sort of really pin it down. Yeah, it's um, it's mercurial, kind of like it's you know the color of its leaves. It 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 flits through the moonlight and it's it's ghostly and it's um, wicked. Hmm. That's, wicked that's is it. the one. Yeah, I don't. Oh, I'd say mischievous, but yeah, I definitely think that you've got it exactly spot on of. The way you try and look at the leaves and you can't tell if they're silver or if they're green and they're just constantly sort of shifting that little bit. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly how I feel the spirit is exactly the same. And, and I just think part of that shifting is how versatile it is, you know, how many things you can use it for, um, you know, from inks to um, incenses to baths, um, to, you know, washes to clear off um, bad spirits and things like that and um, to, you know, wreaths. I think I'm uh, pretty sure that there is a, a wreath made of wormwood was for a headache. I just can't remember where I got that reference from, but I'm pretty sure that's right. If you had a headache, you could make yourself a wreath of wormwood, place it on the brow, oh. and it would cure you of your headache. Um it's in terms of medicine it's it is used for so many things you know um it's used in a lot of menstrual disorders um and so you know if you're pregnant maybe don't use wormwood um it is uh it's one of it's interesting because different books suggest it when there is a threat of miscarriage um and i kind of but at the same time, it is a a uterine stimulant. Um, you know, it's not um, it's not for it's not going to cause an abortion, um, but it may stimulate the uterus, and you may spontaneously um, have a miscarriage. So yeah, don't use it if you're pregnant. Basically, it's a very uh, it's a very tricksy herb in that way, so I just I just wouldn't. If I was you, don't do it. Um, but we use it for so many things. Um, it's used for blood medicine. It's used for um, vomiting. It's used for colic babies, so you can use it for colic in babies. It's used for pain, um, so nerve pain or rheumatism pain. Um, mugwort's used for gout um, as a pain reliever. You can use... Um, wormwood for the same sort of thing um because it has the same a lot of the same um, effects on inflamed tissue um as a poultice i've done it as a poultice on inflamed tissue um yeah just it has a lot of uses medicinally that um we don't really we don't really consider um when we do the magic um and perhaps we should so well, it's, the list is absolutely massive. But I will also mention that if you do use it as, say, an incense, that the smoke is incredibly toxic, so to make sure you're sort of in a ventilated room with it. Yeah. But, yeah, just one of those little disclaimers out there. But, yeah, all its medicinal properties are just absolutely endless. It really is quite an amazing herb. Yeah, it's, it's strong. I think that's what everyone sort of forgets it's like it, it's easy to dismiss as as just a plant and this is what we've talked about before with all plants right it's easy to dismiss it as just a plant and in different ways it's going to be less um strong you know it's you know as a hydrosol or um you know a plant water um it's beautiful you know the scent is wonderful and it's gentle but you know you drink it drink that plant water and you're going to certainly feel its effects um, <laughs> and not all of them are nice. Yeah, and I know that just talking about the strength of it, that I know generally you know you should use your proportions of like an one ounce herb to 20 ounces of water, similar to 15 minutes, 
but wormwood is generally like one tablespoon of the herbs to 20 ounces of water and that's what I seem to find in every reference that I have to it everybody mentions just the strength of it and I mean like you said you can tell just by going near the plant it's you barely have to touch it and you can smell it it's so almost sticky yeah and I think we talked about that before with um uh some of Daniel Schulk's um amounts of herbs that he tells you to use sometimes they're very he, he seems to offer you a, a lot <laughs> more than I would ever use kind of thing. I'm just looking through. I've got a, a fantastic book called Medical Herbalism, um, The Science and Practice of Herbal Medicine by David Hoffman. Um, he has usually quite an extensive um, part on how um, how strong plants are and, and what the um, breakdowns are of, of each plant and how you should use them. Um, just looking it up. It seems as though if you've got the surname Hoffman, you're just destined to be some sort of amazing chemist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Artemisia absinthium. Here we go. Um, preparation and dosage. Tincture dosage is one to four mils three times a day, one to one in 25%. Um, yeah, so it is sort of looking at the, so daily dosage of the herb is two to three grams, um, three to ten mils of tincture a day. So that's very low, you know, when you, you compare to other, other plants. So, yeah, looks like one of those ones where you just have to be careful, as you said. Um, just be careful of the amount of essential oil um, that may be in different things because the essential oil is very, very, very strong. I was just looking here in um, Witchcraft Medicine. I noticed that they mentioned that it's generally good for an antidote for poisoning from mushrooms. Of course. They don't specify what kind of mushrooms, but, and I know I'd, met, I'd seen somewhere else, I don't remember the plants now, I actually wrote them down, but someone else mentioned a few other ones that they're actually an antidote for. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, yeah, guys, there is just so many things to learn about wormwood and, and plants in general. Um, you really need to have a very broad um, study base you know you need to be looking at at serious hurt books like Hoffman um you know because you can both buy like there's a couple of books around that are like herbal remedies and there's like they're little thick books but they they just don't tell you anything about plant um from terms of a safety um aspect and so you know really really finding books that talk about that and how you can use them and stuff like that um is hugely important. Actually, our book of the month this month is uh, Richard Chech, and he talks about wormwood. One thing Richard is excellent at is talking about how much of it you should take. Um, it does say this herb is not for long-term use and is somewhat, somewhat self-limiting since after one or several weeks, the bitter taste becomes repugnant. At this point, the bitters have generally done their work and it is time to discontinue the therapy. So that's a, a good point, erring on the side of caution there. Um, yeah, and if you're preparing, grinding or otherwise handling large quantities of the herb, a filter mask should be worn. Basically, you just don't need that much of it in your system. <laughs> no, his, his work is absolutely great. No, yeah, he's tincturing it. The dried herb that's one to five ratio, but this book I don't know if we should discuss it now, but yeah, this book is absolutely phenomenal. It's one of those ones that really, really opened my eyes when I found it. I've just absolutely fallen in love with it. Yeah, um, so that's a great segue actually. We really should talk about Richard Chech. Um, he is one of what would you say? He's the father of parts of the herbal medicine, probably parts of taking herbal medicine into 
a sciencey sort of area. Um, he spent a lot of time thinking about formulation and how we make the different um, herbal medicines, whether they're tinctures and extracts and things like that. Um, I would say that this book, this book being Making Plant Medicine, no, that's not it. Yes, Making Plant Medicine by Richo Chech. It's R-I-C-H-O-C-H-C-E-C-H. -C 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 um, he also has a book called At Risk Herbs, um, Cultivating At Risk Herbs, which is fantastic um, as well. Um, he runs Horizon Herbs in the States, or he and his family, um, which, you know, if you're in the States, you can order herbs from. You can order herbs from them here. Um, it just depends what we'll get through customs. Um, and please keep our biosecurity at, in mind when you're um, doing things like this. Um, Chech is, he's the formulary guru. Would you say that, Ru? Definitely. This is one of those books that I know when I first saw it, I sort of looked at the cover and went, oh, I was expecting it to be a bit more airy-fairy and one of those ones that's really light on material that's, you know, like you said before, you find those books that doesn't really have all that much. But it is absolutely fascinating. He pretty much has this great in-depth guide through the book of all the different ways to make, like, tinctures, to everything that you can imagine. Let me just quickly go to his index. So, yeah, he talks about, you know, in the first section that he goes through sort of how he got into herbology and sort of what really piqued his interests. But he goes through making tinctures, the basic processes, the terminology, which I found absolutely awesome because I feel like it's something you don't really find in many other places. Mm. You know, there's times where I've been having discussions with you and, you know, I notice a lot of the words you mention and he has those explanations. But he goes through vinegar extracts to herbal glycerites, teas and decoctions, herbal soaking syrups, herbal oils, salves, creams, poultices, compressions, soaks. And then he has this massive herbal formulary. It's just, it's one of those books that I feel like everyone should have. There's nothing magical in it, but it's how to actually make use of all these herbs that we're talking about. Like, if you want to learn how to make tinctures, this is an absolutely amazing book for it. Yeah, because he doesn't just, especially with tinctures, he doesn't just tell you, put the herb in alcohol. Um, he actually, for each herb, he often talks about which, what percentage alcohol you want. Um, because different um, aspects of the herb will distill at different strengths of alcohol, uh, not distill, um, precipitate out um, of the herb at different strengths of alcohol. Um, and those things are really important to get the best um, the best tincture you can. You know, I would rather have um, 30 mils of excellent tincture than 500 mils of crappy tincture. 100%. Yeah, and, and that's an awesome thing too is, like you said, you go through every herb and it has their, like, on Wormwood, 1 to 5 for tincture of derived herb, 50A to 50W. Water extracts, your everything of how to do it, your dosage, your contradictions, your processes, um, cautionaries, everything. It's just so encompassing. Whereas, you know, there's one of the other great books that I'm sure plenty of people have on their shelves of Incest Oils and Brews by Scott Cunningham. It's great, but it doesn't have this sort of needed chemistry as to what this book has. This book is really, really phenomenal. Yeah. And don't get us wrong, it's a small book. Hmm. You know, it's a, it's a little one that uh, you can you can grab it and put it on your phone. Like you can get it electronically um, from the Amazon store. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, I've actually got it on my Kindle, which is awesome because then, you know, say I want to look up certain nerve, you just type it into the search thing rather than – because, you know, there will be so many different references through different sections of it as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, he he talks about the mathematics of tincturing, um, which is terrifying to me because I really hate math. Um, <laughs> I could just do. Um, and, it, yeah, but it's actually very accessible um, and really worth it to sit down and work it out um, and talking about and understanding what he talks about, 
you know, it's worth it. Um, oh, wow, what else? It, it's funny because when you start to read it, you think it might be a bit airy-fairy because he's, he tells these long rambling stories. Um, <clears throat> and, yeah, you're exactly right. The, the front cover is like this mandala thing with, you know, really hippie lettering on it. and But the book is so, so in-depth. Um, and but brief in a in a way that just makes sure that you get the information you need, um, and not all the stuff you don't. Yeah, I think if I had to narrow down my book collection to essential books, this would definitely be in my top five. It's one of those ones that if I had to grab something. This is one I'd grab when the house is burning down. Oh God, don't see, don't even say it. <laughs> I couldn't cope. I couldn't cope. It's all of my books. There's so many precious. Oh, <laughs> uh, just dragging them out by the like. Even my bookshelf, I've got this special cupboard that I'm in love with, and I've often thought, if the house burnt down, how would I manage to get it out in time? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, jeez, that, that took a turn for the dark. Um, <laughs> no, let's let's not let's not ever talk of that again. Um, because witches losing their bookshelves is just the world's biggest tra- tragedy. Oh, entirely. <laughs> so back to Rich Hochech. Um, there's a lot of, if you bought this book for nothing else, buy it for the teachers. Um, it's amazing. Um, one of the other things in here that I really love is his honeys, uh, honeyed roots. So I was, Ella Campaign is one of the foulest tasting roots known to man. Absolutely disgusting. Like, think of the smell of valerian and (laughs) make it about 20 billion times bitterer and that's how bad this root tastes. Um, It is awful, but it is fantastic. For respiratory infections and throat infections and um, things like that but I can only stomach it if I put it in honey um, so basically what you do is you boil it in some honey or you bring some honey to the boil with the root chopped up into it um, and you keep it warm for half an hour or so let the honey soak right into the root and then you pour all the honey and the root back into the jar and when you are feeling disgustingly unwell, you take that bit of root and you chew it up and it's candied. It's still bitter, but it is not unpalatable bitter. Um, and it's just the best. You can do it with marshmallow, which would be awesome and taste delicious. But, you know, I can have marshmallow all the time without <laughs> that. But um, as in marshmallow root, um, I cannot do it with Ella Campaign. <laughs> it's kind of ironic. The better the herb for you, the more absolutely foul and disgusting it tastes. All yeah. those tannins are just absolutely sickening. Yeah, I this is it's one of those herbs that I just don't like, but it works so so well. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's another um, trick. I don't know if it applies to this root, but I have found has worked really well in the past. So if something is incredibly bitter with tannins in it when you're cooking it breaking just an egg white into it allowing that to solidify and then taking the egg white out and often it will actually suck up a lot of the tannins or leaving all the goodness in various different herbs Hmm. it takes heaps of that bitterness out for a lot of things that's fascinating i have to look that up something about proteins Hmm. yeah yeah a friend taught me that trick and i didn't believe it and i tried it and yeah it worked a charm well, I know that they use egg white as a fining agent in winemaking. Um, huh. So a, a smoothing agent. So that would make sense because it would smooth the tannins. There you go. Yeah. Um, so glycerates are a, a fun one. Um, they don't have the shelf life of a tincture, um, which pretty much have an almost indefinite shelf, shelf life. And even if... Um, even if you think your tincture is no longer at its best, um, it's a very interesting thing to use 
in inks and things like that as well. So um, don't throw out your tinctures. Um, just maybe don't use them internally if you feel like they might be past their best. Um, but glycerides are excellent for things like borage and, um, and other pl um, plants where you'll get a different um, aspect of the plant by making a glycerite than you would by making a tincture. Have you made any glycerites before? I actually haven't. I was just quickly skimming over his um, his glycerite section and I've never actually made glycerite. How about you? I've made mainly borage. Borage is probably the main plant I make into the glycerite. Um, and that's, you know, like elderberries go really well in a glycerite for kids and stuff if you want to make something uh, uh, a cough syrup that doesn't have alcohol in it um oh and also on glycerites like for our vegetarian and vegan friends um it doesn't have to be animal glycerin it can be vegetable glycerin um you know there's a lot of vegetable glycerins that come from um coconut and other other different vegetative matter rather than from um pig's ears and weird things like that so, yeah, definitely look at those. I always buy vegetable glycerin because, you know, why would I buy the other one if I can buy a vegetable one? Um, echinacea roots can be made into a glycerin as well. Um, mint makes a fantastic glycerin if you've got an upset tummy um, and you don't want to take alcohol on top of your upset tummy. Um, and, of course, the one thing that you would make a glycerin over a tincture for is for people with alcohol problems or substance abuse problems um you might want to make a tincture it's a bit more work because you've got to keep making it fresh all the time or not you know every couple of weeks but um it is very useful yeah um especially now that we're in winter i'm curious about trying the echinacea glycerite i was just looking at his recipe here for it which it seems pretty straightforward i'm quite curious and just interested to see the different flavor as well compared to you know the bitterness and alcoholic that's a tincture. Yeah. Yeah, I find it it has a little bit of its own personality to it. Um, tinctures are more immediate. Glycerites sort of have a, a slightly slower action, in my opinion. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, and one of the other things he talks about that a lot of, um, you know, you, you'll hear a lot about vinegars and you'll hear a lot about tinctures um, in the herbal community, but you very rarely hear about um, sakai and syrups. And sakai is actually the juice um, of the herb. So any plant that could be juiced or crushed to express juice, um, that you would use to make a sakai. Um, you know, they've got to have a enough flesh to do that, though. And there's not as many plants as you'd think that do, can do that, so... Surprisingly, he says plantain, but I've not really met a plantain that's that juicy <laughs> in Australia. Yeah, no. Um, it's one of those interesting plants, actually, where it's not really what it originally used to be, and now that it's hybridised, they're so, I don't know, dry and flavourless compared to what they used to be as a plant. But I mostly think, like, sugar cane is one of those ones that, you know, I don't know if you've ever had fresh sugar cane and you snap oh it. Oh, my God, just, yes. Oh, <laughs> it oozes and you just suck it out of the stalk and it's amazing. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that sounds amazing. I love I love sugar cane juice, when you're in, especially when you're in Vietnam and um, places like that and they add, like, a little squeeze of um, kumquat to it and it's just, just so incredible. <laughs> now I'm yeah. craving uh, summer. Oh, uh, same. Just thinking about travelling up north. It's just, yeah, all these memories as a kid of my dad pulling over and just cutting a sugar cane as we're driven past it. Oh, it's such an amazing thing. Wow. Actually, one of his recipes for, um, for a sakai is dandelion roots. Now, that'll be a oh. bitter little thing. Basically, he says take... Mm -hmm. How many hundred grams? Uh, 500 grams of fresh dandelion roots mashed and pressed to yield 315 mils of juice. And then you have to add 105 mils of mm, 
grain alcohol. I don't know what proof he's saying there, but it'll have to be high proof because it's got to be, it's got to end up at 20% alcohol. So it, that would be probably a 95% proof at 100 mils um, so that it doesn't go off. Um, and then he says to set it aside for three days for to settle, so to settle out in the um, fibrous matter um, and then decant through a cheesecloth or paper filter. So um, I might have to give that a go. There's a lot of dandelions around right now, um, you know, because we've had such a weird summer um, and autumn that a lot of the dandelions are having a real hard second go at it. See whether I can make some dandelion juice, which I'm sure yeah, will be it's... disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those strange ones that there's actually so many recipes for dandelion. Mm. Um, I was wanting to ask you, because, you know, on the topic of tinctures, in Australia at least, you used to be able to get, and they've discontinued it only recently, which has absolutely broken my heart, King's 190 proof alcohol, which was a grain spirit, which is absolutely awesome, which was 95% alcohol volume. So I know you probably just make your own, but any recommendations of what our Australian listeners can use now that that has been discontinued? Yes. Um, well, of course, I wouldn't make my own because it's illegal to make alcohol mm. in Australia. Um, but you can get, there is a, um, just looking up the name because I won't be able to pronounce it properly. Um, you can get this at Dan Murphy's. You have to ask for it. They've usually got it behind the counter. Um, it is called spiritus so s-p-i-r-y-t-u-s so spiritus rectifuani <laughs> so if I, i'm gonna have to put that into the um into the thing sorry not r-e-k-t-i-k-i-o-w-a-n-y um it is 95 percent alcohol comes with one of those little tags on it that says do not drink straight um, it's 500 mils. Um, it's a, yeah, it's basically rectified spirit in, I don't know, Polish or something is the word. Um, and it's usually about $70 for 500 mils. Um, so you do want to make sure that you're, you know, making the best tincture you can if you're going to use something that's that expensive. Um, but again, look at, look at Richo's book. There's a couple of charts online that say what um, percentage of alcohol you need to use with different plants. There's one that is based off Jetch's book. I'll try and find it and link it to the show notes. Um, you don't always need to use 95%. You just add more, of course. So if I've got a 50% alcohol um, instead of 100%, then I have to add twice as much. So I think I have to check my math, but I think that's right. <laughs> I'm, I'm tricking myself and making myself think it's four times as much, but that's not true. Um, so, <laughs> yes. So if I have 500 mils of juice and I add 500 mils of 50% alcohol, then I end up with 25% alcohol in the final thing. Now you need to get 20. So, yeah, it is roughly half half. You're taking me back to high school math where it's like if Belle had this many of this and this many of this, how would she many if she had this? <laughs> <laughs> if Belle has five um five hundred mils of one hundred percent alcohol and she drinks it, how long will it take her to die? <laughs> <laughs> alcohol poison, guaranteed. Um yeah, so <laughs> All fun and games aside, don't drink the hundred percent alcohol, kids. Um, very, very bad. You can there's stories all over the internet. Um, they tried to get it actually, Dan Murphy stopped selling it recently, earlier in the year because some teenager in Adelaide had had like two shots of it and ended up in hospital. Oh um, God, there's always someone. Yeah, there's always someone. This is why we have warning labels. <laughs> 
to pit dumb people don't read warning labels. <laughs> uh, bring back natural selection. Yeah, that's right. Um, so the book has a fantastic um, section on baths, compresses, and poultices. Um, it probably talks about poultices in a more detailed way than most books. Like most books go, oh, you can use a poultice. They're very easy. Just crush the herb up, um, wrap it in some cloth and pr place it on the area. Um, he th goes into it um, much more um, and talks about how, um, you know, it's, he says uh, simply a vegetable material which is whole or mashed, which is laid or spread on the skin, right? But then he talks about how to do it and the quantity and how much you would need for a mid-sized poultice and whether you need to moisten it or, you know, it's there's more to it than just smashing up the plant and putting it on your knee, you know? Mm. And as we were discussing before, our herb of the month is one of those great ones that's meant to be great for sprained ankles or bruising or anything like that. So if you want to give it a go, yeah, get some wormwood. Um... With his formulary, I do want to say something. Um, Richo does say that things are good for cancers. Um, I am firmly of the belief that if you have a cancer um, and you are looking for a treatment, you should be consulting with health professionals. And even if you choose to go the herbal medicine route, you should consult with your, your health professional um, about whether it will interact with your other treatments. Um, I, I don't like that he says um, has been known to cure mouth cancer and things like that in different places of this book. I do think that when we talk about curing cancer, A, is it not only it's illegal to say that sort of stuff without um, clinical trials, um, it gives people false hope and, um, you know, it may work. And if it does, fantastic, that's awesome, but please don't, pin all your hopes on this kind of thing. Um, yeah, because he, you know, he says, for treating cancer, burdock is often combined with red clover. But what does that mean? <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, I just don't think that uh, you should pin all your hopes on a book that's, you know, thinner than my finger about cancer. So that's my rant for the day. No, definitely. Maybe it's just natural selection, right? <sighs> No, not at all. It's, yeah. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> it is a difficult, difficult topic. Um, but, yeah, I do want people to not just take the words of a of just one book on anything. No. But we said that earlier as well. Um, one of the interesting things in the book that I didn't even think about was cotton. Um, he suggests using the root bark of cotton plants dug in the late summer or fall um, and using it for to improve the tone of the uterus and male sexual organs. Um, <laughs> it, it can bring on delayed menses used during labour to um, add strength to the con contractions. Um, yeah, it's I – didn't, I didn't even think of cotton as a medicinal herb. No, you don't think of it really doing anything. There's always that question in my mind of, how did someone ever originally figure this out to begin with? It's sort of like how the ancient Egyptians figured out that acacia leaves are a natural birth control. So you hear about them stuffing acacia leaves into their vaginal cavities. And it's like, how did they figure this out to begin with? Yeah. <laughs> and that's where we come down to that divine inspiration you know yeah did a spirit tell them to do that or, or <laughs> did, um you know just some crabby old lady go well if you put acacia leaves down there it's going to get all scratchy no one's going to want to go there so it's birth control <laughs> <laughs> uh it's like that story of the guy who has the rock that keeps away the tigers it's like well do you see any tigers <laughs> that's terrible oh no <laughs> That's the, that's the worst dad joke. Uh, 
It's, have you not ever heard that old wives' tale about the person selling rocks that's meant to keep away tigers, but it's in an area that has no tigers? I'm not sure I can be your friend anymore. Tip of the snake on <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> dad jokes. Oh. But oh. he does go through a amazing variety of herbs, um, some very common, some that are common to North America um, and not so common here. Uh, excuse my yawns, um, some that you would have to grow um, and some you can forage. Um, but there are enough good things in here um, that it is worth owning this book. Mm, definitely. It's, like I said, it's tiny and abundant. What do you think you want to work with it from the next month? Um like to look at more tinctures especially since you've pointed out working with different proof alcohols to sort of see what you can get out of them i'd be really really curious to um work with wormwood tincture i think oh yeah it's rock and roll wormwood tincture is amazing you can just pop it in some um uh in some wine and it's great to help you get into a trance state. Um, one of the one of my customers likes to put wormwood plant into gin. Um, oh. Says that's a bit rock and roll. <laughs> that's interesting. I'm a massive, massive gin drinker, so I'm going to have to definitely give that one a try. Yeah. Um, one of the plants that he does talk about here is Lobelia. Um, so Lobelia inflata, now not all Lobelias are created equal, um, but it is one of the plants which is, which is a really low-dose botanical. Um, and I think one it's almost owning the book is worth it for Lobelia alone um, because it has um, an amazing um, reputation for results in lung conditions, um, you know, coughs, asthma. Um, you know, just chronically weak lung and things like that. It's also mo like the most vomitous um, of plants, but it is a massive emetic. Um, so you have to treat it as very low dose. Um, but that's in there. Actually, he's got a whole section on low dose botanicals, um, which is fascinating as well. Yeah, it's one of those ones that I feel like there's just so much information. Every single herb, it's insane how much research he's done into every single little thing yeah and he does talk about smoking the different herbs um in some places like you know when he talks about mullen and colt's foot and things like that um he talks about sp smoking them for um lung complaints um actually guys i've got heaps and heaps of mullen plants right now um so if you're in melbourne and you want some mullen and I mean the giant ones, the greater ones, um, let me know. Hit me up because I've got probably 20 of them, and if I grew 20 of them, you wouldn't be able to see my front yard. <laughs> Sorry for the mullet. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just hit me up. Um, I think I'm going to make – I'm definitely going to make some sockeye. I really want to make that dandelion um, sockeye and taste it and – feel its effects on my system um it's kind of an underrated thing to try a herb when you're not sick um and feel how it affects you and how it makes you feel and um how it what physiological effects it has on your body you know does it give you diarrhea does it make you want to vomit does it um <laughs> what's your heart rate like um you know, how's your sleep? Do you have to pee more? Um, you know, all of those things are really interesting um, things to do with herbs. You know, obviously taking into account counterindications and other medications that you take and all of those things. Mm. Yeah, um, I'm also curious, you mentioned as well what you were pointing out before with these honeys and soaking roots in honeys is another interesting one because I've got a few herbs that hate the taste of so I might give that a go as well yeah yeah it's really good 
really, really, really good. Um, Damiana leaf tastes awesome when you infuse it in whiskey. So I make my tincture for Damiana with, with um, like, Johnny Walker um, cheap whiskey. And then I mix it with honey, basically 50-50 with honey. And I end up with a Damiana liqueur, which is just quite simply amazing. Like, it is just incredible. Fantastic for the bedroom, <laughs> um, but also amazing <laughs> for Beltane rights um, and spring um, rights and things like that. That's, yeah, that's an interesting one. I haven't thought about really using things like whiskies before and normally use, yeah, a lot of the more clear alcohols. But I also know, like, you can mix um, wormwood with rum is another way to sort of take it as well. So, yeah, that'd be interesting to try with whiskey. Ooh, that's good. I have some I have some delicious rums and some of them are quite sweet. Um, so I might try some wormwood in those. Um, yeah. steep them in it for, steep it in it for a few days and uh, and see how those go. Yeah. That might be a very good winter solstice drink, I think. Yeah, definitely. So speaking of winter solstice, it is yes. in a week's time. Um is, do you do anything special? It's one of those ones that I try to, I don't always make it there. Um, Sauron's generally the one that I definitely make the effort for every single year, but I'm pretty excited for it this year. I'm, especially with what we've sort of got, um, what we've got concocting together, I'm especially excited, but I definitely think I'm going to do sort of everything that we've spoken about previously. A lot of trans work, a lot of emanative work during this time of year in this cold, dark period I think is absolutely perfect for it so I'm I'm very excited for next week what have you got planned yeah I tend to do a lot of burning at winter solstice um mm. you know I always get the get the cauldron out and um and set fire to stuff um, <laughs> it just always happens like that um it's a good time to go through the old herbs um and and ditch any old dried herbs that are past their best. Um, you know, that's always good. And I chuck them all in the cauldron and just set it all on fire um, outside, <laughs> <laughs> not inside. Um, yeah, it's Thursday night, so I'll have yoga. Um, oh, yeah, how's that working out? Whoa. Yeah. It's gotten easier. <laughs> let's just say let's just say there is no such thing as an inversion in this witch's life. Uh I this witch does not go upside down. <laughs> it doesn't happen. <laughs> I'm I'm hoping less screams of agony than, than before. Uh yeah, definitely less screams of agony. Um but um we're at that point in the course where everyone else is starting to, you know, look limber and life and and, and turn upside down and do headstands and, and things like that. And I'm like, I, no, no, I don't do a headstand. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> it's not happening. So, um, yeah, that is, they are my, perhaps my physical and my mental limitations when it comes to yoga. Um, but, yeah, I think it's good to do that spiritual practice um, on the winter solstice as well, um, that real our yoga teacher is not as woo as some um but not as non-woo as others it's not all physical she does do she does talk about the mental side of it as well um and the spiritual side of it but she doesn't sort of try to force it down your throat yeah cool um which is fantastic actually she's she's just brilliant um but yeah so i'll probably i'll probably do a little bit of burning um I'll do some yoga. Um, there will, of course, be lots of um, lots of concocting happening um, and sort of final blessings of things um, through fires and stuff. It's good to just let go of the first half of the year. I know that, you know, traditionally it's the start of the new year, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, Western calendar, it's the first half of the year. And for a lot of us, we're coming right up on that end of financial year if you work in big business um, and you've just got so much stuff to do, 
because the winter solstice is a week before the end of the financial year, the end's in sight, you can kind of start that, let it all go and start all over again in July. <laughs> so it all does some, sort of come to a, a head for me in sort of those sort of areas. I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm just imagining you in like, 80s spandex with a headband limbering up in front of a cauldron and just burning stuff erratically. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. And anyone who's ever seen me knows how absurd that is. Um, it's like Melissa McCarthy um, with red hair um, in spandex. So I hope you all enjoy that mental image. Um, thanks, Rude. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's all I've got in my head. <laughs> yep, I'm just chucking things in there, singing, let's get physical. And, uh, <laughs> No, it's, uh, let's get spiritual, right? Let's get spiritual, spiritual. spiritual. <laughs> All right, now um, we've tortured everyone with that. Sorry. Um. <laughs> oh, well, I think that's a good way to end it. It is. It is. It, we've been uh, giving you a, an hour and 20 minutes worth of um, craziness and plants and herbs and magic and um we did have a request for Wormwood. I will play the lovely voicemail we received at the end. Um, and, yeah, we look, we really we enjoy doing this podcast. We're six months in and um, it's time to thank all our listeners and, um, and thank all the plants that we work with. And thank you, Wade Sachadolsky, who is our new um, audio engineer. Um, his website will be linked in our show notes. So... Um, if you need audio engineering for your band, podcast, uh, or other audio event, um, he is a qualified audio engineer, not just some backyard hack. Um, he, he, he has a degree <laughs> um, and he does an amazing job. He also makes Ooh. an awesome coffee, <laughs> which was how I met him. Um, Good to know. But no, he <laughs> is a fantastic audio engineer and he's put up with uh, our technical glitches and um, helped us out with our sometimes short time frames as well. Um, it is the Feast of St. Anthony of Padua tomorrow, so if you've lost something, say a prayer to St. Anthony, you might find it. Um, he's also, later in the week, is St. Vitus, um, who is the patron saint of comedians and epileptics um kind of funny i've just got this saints calendar on my phone and it just keeps popping up and i have to look them all up but i'm finding out about all these interesting saints um it's just such a weird thing to sort of conjure together the saint of comedians and epileptics yeah <laughs> yeah well, they used to call epilepsy saint vitus's dance um yeah it's kind of weird there's but yeah it's fascinating saints are amazingly fascinating because a lot of them are like pagans or or they do these great magical feats um you know like uh -huh. saint saint one of the i don't know a lot of them are boiled in cauldrons um you know they all have weird animal familiars um yeah most of them are pagan gods or then you know yeah like you said saint patrick he did this feat of chasing away the snakes in ireland yeah, but there weren't ever any snakes in them. Again, like the rock with the tigers. <laughs> <laughs> Damn rocks. <laughs> oh, all right, all right. And on that note, I'm going to say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Go away, Rue. <laughs> no. <laughs> I need you. Um, yeah, thanks, everyone, for listening. Um, you can find us at gardenofinkandbones.com. Um, we are on Instagram, Garden of Ink and Bones. Uh, you can email us questions at gardenofinkandbones.com. You can leave us a voicemail at the website. Um, you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Um, you can do us the biggest, greatest service in the world and tell your friends. Um, probably more important to us than reviews, we, we just want to reach as many um, fabulous witches, wizards, um, and other magical beings as we can, because we hope that you guys find this interesting. Definitely. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Have a great solstice. Goodbye.
Hey Belle and Rue, it's Buck Agrius here. Um, I'm only just catching up to this podcast, so I wanted to say a big thank you. I'm absolutely loving it. I'm only into episode one so far, so I've got a bit of catching up to do. I really enjoyed the information you shared on Mugwort, and um, I personally use it for my teas in uh, divination work and also for dream work. And I actually find it's a beautiful uh, plant to work with. I personally have a strong spirit ally connection with uh, the spirit uh, found in Wormwood and was wondering if you might be doing an episode on that in the near future. Um, I've actually got it tattooed on my body uh, and also trying to grow it from seeds at the moment. So it plays a big role in my witchcraft. Um, So any information you've got on uh, advice on how to grow it would be cool. And also, again, just some information on its uses historically and magically just uh, to give us further insight. Another plant that I work a lot with is also juniper berry. It's another one that's tattooed on my body and um, be quite interested again to hear about your insights on juniper. Anyway, thank you both so so much for this podcast. I'm absolutely loving it. And um, also, Belle, I've got a few of your flying ointments and really, really find the quality of your work quite incredible. Um, So thank you. Bye. Bye.